Oh, when it kicks on, it gets cold fast. But then it kicks on and we make the head prayer chain.
okay, this was more what I expected to see. We had a bunch of us um, in the wrong room. We'd followed the link from the calendar. So it's a little late, but I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order at 10.08 a.m. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're called to order. Okay. So first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the February meeting. Has everyone had a chance to look those over? So moved. I move to uh, accept the meetings of the February membership meeting. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it, Carrie. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, moving along. Executive board reports. We have a material handling policy recommendation from the circulation committee. Um, Rhonda, would you like to discuss that briefly? Sure. Um, the committee has recommended that we amend the materials handling best practices document so that there is a more clear timeline on when invoices can be sent for lost da and damaged material. So basically that timeline would be uh, it's been lost for six months, but not more than 18 months. So just to kind of codify, you know, determine this is the time frame that billing should be taking place in. This was um, approved by the executive board in the previous, in our meeting before this one. And Steve is sharing it on the screen. So there, are there any questions about this issue? You have to check. Make sure there's no questions in the chat. Yeah. And remind everybody to sign in. Yeah, people are just signing in. There's no questions so far. Okay, so I knew how to handle this in the executive board. Does this require a motion since it came from committee? No, it's recommendation from the committee still so okay no motion report okay so uh if there's no discussion i will call for a vote to adopt this change to the missouri evergreen consortium handling material handling best practices policy all in favor okay. any op any opposed okay so the motion has passed um, da, 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 da. Next item, operational and organizational status policy recommendation. This also um, went through executive board this morning. So I will let Steve talk about this. Yeah, I, I brought this to the executive board. Um, and again, this is sort of more along the lines of us leaning into uh, our identity as a 501c3 membership organization, as opposed to a 501c3 organization that gets qualif qualified as a quasi-governmental um, um, entity. Uh, some attorneys I'm working with are suggesting that language like what's in italics in your packet probably should be in our bylaws and probably should be in our MOU. And we, um, uh, I am committed to help make sure that those are embedded in those things the next time we revise them. Uh, but for now, um, taking... Um, uh, passing a resolution that talks about this is how we view ourselves and then operating in that way uh, will go a long way if we are if we are challenged as to exactly what we are. Um, and so that's the, the italicized section there just basically says that um, that, that uh, we use the MOU that kind of outlines um, our behavior expectations and that um, the MOU is non-binding um, and that it's not considered comprehensive 
and that other areas may be um, added. And, and that's just general not, uh, information that you would find uh, for a membership organization as opposed to um, a contracted vendor or a quasi-government. So with that, I'll return it back to Ron and feel free to um, answer any questions that might come. So are there any questions about this policy proposal? It, it seems to me it's really all about wording. It really doesn't change a whole lot of how we're operating. It's just words to keep us on the good side of the, the you know, our identity, I guess, is the best way to put it. If there are no questions, I will call for a vote. Um, does this, since this was a proposal from staff, should this require a, a motion and a second, Steve? Um, you know, to be safe, probably so, because I don't think we officially consider the executive board as an executive committee. So okay. it doesn't hurt to have a motion in a second anyway. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I need a motion to adopt. Um, the policy recommendation from staff. So moved. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. This is a membership meeting. Anybody can do, you know, it doesn't have to be executive board. Yeah, that's right. All members are. Yeah. I totally understand you feel like you're behind the eight ball when you're not there in person. That's, there's that there's that just a little bit of a lag. So we do have a motion and a second. Any further questions or discussion? All righty, chair calls for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All righty. The policy recommendation stands as adopt, adopted as voted. Um, other activities under executive board reports. What are our other activities? Uh, Ron, I just put that there in case the executive board wanted to um, uh, bring out, bring forward anything that was discussed at the meeting this morning. Okay. I think one thing we'll just um, bring up is we are looking at um, an executive board retreat to kind of kind of give us some direction of where to where we're going from here um, we are kind of doing an identity shift you know moving more toward resource sharing moving towards our more leaning more on identity as a 501c3 so we are planning um, an executive board retreat to um, solidify that direction in which we need to move I think that was pretty much what we need what other than what you're going to see on the agenda, that was pretty much the only other thing we talked about in the executive board. Um, well, I, I, one other thing that we do need to discuss. Um, Rebecca Lewis is uh, was our president-elect and should be taking over as chair in um, July 1st, but she is expecting an addition to her family. And I know from experience, it was more than a full-time job to do my job and be chair of Evergreen. I would not want to take care of an infant on top of that. So she has stepped down. She's still a member of the board, but has stepped down from her position as president-elect of the board. And the executive board approved Carrie Klein to step into that position for the remainder of this year. And then Carrie will move up to chair of the consortium on July 1st. And Mary Beth says, thank you, Carrie. And, and yes, definitely. Thank you, Carrie, for um, being so agreeable to it and just jumping in with both feet with very little preparation. So we do appreciate that. And we thank, we thank Rebecca for her willingness to have served. Um, but it's just, she needs that, that time with that baby without us pulling any attention away from her at all. So um, I think this is best all the way around for everybody involved. 
um, let's go ahead and move into executive director report. So um, I'll try to make this quick and, um, and painless. Um, current migrations, um, I think everyone tracked that West Plains came up um, at, at the end of last month in, in March and has been going very, very well. Um, one of the things that did come up, and I, and I think this is probably worth sharing with the general membership just so that everybody kind of knows that this happened. Um, Greg, Greg tends to be curious and tends to like to kick the tires and, and ask interesting questions and one of the things that he did during his migration was um, uh, start asking questions about um, a children's catalog, which is what they used to have on TLC. And we discovered Evergreen does have such a thing. It's called KPAC. And it's very different in structure from the OPAC. Um, it doesn't work. It, it, you know, it, it, it isn't populated with buckets and things like that. It's it just kind of apples and oranges and how it, how it operates. But it is a children's version of the OPAC. And so uh, Greg is working with Rogan from Equinox to kind of figure out what this would look like and see if there's a way that we might be able to use what he does for anybody else who might be interested in having a children's only version of their OPAC. Uh, more to come, but for right now, um, Equinox is kind of agreeable to kind of let Greg kick the tires, figure this out for all of us and then potentially adopt it broader. So um, sometimes there's these happy accidents that happen during a migration, and that's that's one of the things that's happened here. Um, uh, Adair County will be coming up uh, in May, and uh, just out of the corner of my peripheral vision, I saw Janet, uh, interest, uh, the State Library, is talking about being there in, uh, in person uh, for the Adair County um, go live, whether it's day of, day after, something along those lines. Um, I, I appreciate that because I'll actually be out of the country on the on the go live date. I always try to get there at least day of or day after is, is, is my SOP. So thank you, Janet and Robin, for, for, for doing that. Um, next up is Sarcoxy. We are continuing to uh, wait to get confirmation from Sarcoxy, Sarcoxy to sign all their paperwork so we can start getting them um, uh, on board. They are, we are still targeting the end of June uh, for them. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if we make that. Um, and then um, next up after that will be the MLC. And, and, and as I said earlier this morning, um, I can't be uh, more happy with how the MLC has already been engaging with us. They've been coming to training. Uh, uh, they've requested some access to some test servers for their catalogers so they can really hit the ground running. And I think they're going to be a great partner for us um, in terms of you know, joining the community and helping us move the ball. So, um, so always great to, uh, to to have somebody to have organizations that anxious about getting on board. So that's very exciting for us. Um, and then that that's our migration schedule. Of course, still scheduled to look at them. Um, uh, Q four, uh, the the last of uh, the last of this calendar year. And then uh, I'll just let you know I've been contacted by I think at last count I had one more last night. Um, so there's there are now five libraries that have contacted me about migration in 2025. So um, so yeah, I don't think we're slowing down. Um, that's where we are on migrations. Uh, moving to next um, next comment, just just FYI, just because I like to keep you up to date on this, we have 77 members of those 77. 65 have the MOUs in. Actually, I think I, I think 66. I think Carrollton's just came in, and I just haven't had able uh, just last night. So I don't think I've had a chance to update that. Uh, so we're in good shape in terms of MOU. Now remember, technically, once we reach 75% of the membership signing the MOU, the MOU is what we follow, that it binds everybody at that. Point. So we'd still like to have those final 11, or I'm sorry, uh, final 10 uh, signed and in, but um, but we are now following the new MOU. That is the That, that is our standard. And uh, user conference report. I just wanted to just quickly say thank you for everybody who attended, to all those who are here in person, as well as those who attended online. Um, I, I think it was um, it, it was a good member conference. I think we can improve. I think we talked about many ways to improve. This morning, um, I just quick mea culpa. I mean, my feeling is that um, I really didn't 
fully appreciate everything we need to do for the member conference or even that we were doing the member conference until um, several months into my tenure, which was probably about six months ago. And then anyone who's ever planned things like this know you start planning these the day after the last one ended. And so, um, so I felt like there's a few things I could have been doing better, you know, had I been maybe a little more aware uh, maybe had my feet on the ground with the organization, but we get, we had some great ideas on um, ways to move forward and new things to do uh, next time. But there was definitely a consensus that people want to do this again next time. Uh, for those who attended, who were registered through Odoo, um, I sent out uh, the uh, a link to the PowerPoints for everything. Yes, last night an evaluation. Please, please, please evaluate and don't give me all fives. Tell the truth and put in everything that needs to, you know, everything that needs to improve and things you'd like to see different. It's the same evaluation Mickey used last year, so we can kind of compare the two. It gives us kind of a baseline and points. Um, and I think, oh, um, the the videos. Um, I, all the videos have been. I saw that they were archived in Zoom. I'll move those over to our YouTube channel um, as probably sometime next week. Hopefully I'll get it done next week before I leave on vacation. And while I've got everybody's attention, I, I will be going on vacation on Friday and be gone for two weeks. Um, so so yeah, please, please don't erase any critical files while I'm done. No, just kidding, just kidding. That's what I do. You guys don't do those things. Uh, but um, uh, I, I I know everything will will uh, go well while I'm gone and and honestly it's just a good SOP and not for profit management for your executive director to be gone for at least a week if not two weeks from time to time it, it, it just helps to show that everything you know I'm I'm not hiding things and, and that you can still get to stuff while I'm while I'm um, gone so um, I think that's all I've got for executive directors group for it. any questions or. Can I answer any questions for anyone? Nothing in the chat and I, I hear nothing. So back to you, Ron. It's muted and muted. Yeah. Yeah, Is I it? was muted. I was muted because our courier driver was here and he was not using his inside voice. Um, next on the agenda is financial report which Shannon is not with us. I don't know that Kristen is in the meeting, but I do see that Keith is here. Um, we discussed the financial reports in the executive board and um, thought maybe Keith could shed more light on them if people had questions, but they look good. So, Keith, if you're talking, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. <laughs> As of March 31st, if you look at your profit and loss statement, and the I find the budget to actual statement more realistic. Um, you have an overall loss right now of about $9,000. That's not concerning because your um, your grant payments come in three times a year, so you haven't realized your full grant payment yet. If you could go one more page, Steve, I think. There we go. Budget versus actual, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you look at the grant line, you're only one third of your grant revenue has been received. Um, some notable things on the expense side, um, the largest expenses were your management services fees, so Migos, the salary for the executive director, and your contract cataloging folks. Other than that, it looks pretty, pretty standard and pretty normal. I don't know, Steve, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, probably the one big thing that I'd like to add is that, and, and it's a small number, but it's an important number, is that we received about $210 from our money market uh, investment this year, or not this year, but the, this past month. And so um, so we're making money off of our fund balance and making our money work for us, which is good. It's, it's only $210, but that's $210 we didn't have the month before, and it will continue to grow. And, and Keith, while we've got everybody here, Thank you to Amigos for helping us um, get that set up and work with Brookmont uh, to allow us to, uh, uh, to to make our money work better for us. Sure. I hope you all are happy with Brookmont. Amigos has been work, working with them for 20 plus years and Steve's familiar with them too. They're, they're incredible folks. 
just kind of a reminder for the entire membership, um, when we voted to start investing money, we took a very conservative approach. Um, in future months and years, we might be able to add more into that money market account to draw more interest, but still not hurt our fluid money that we need for day-to-day -day operations. Um, Shannon just wanted to take a very conservative approach until we see how it uh, played out. And you know, I, Steve made the comment in, um, in the executive board that it's found money. So really anything to add to the bottom line, you know, multiplying that out, we'll look at about $2,500 over a year's time. Well, that's, that pays for you know, the website, for instance, or the Odoo or, you know. So you, you all know your budgets. Any little bit you can drag in is going to help. And we're the same way. Um, any questions on the financials? All right, seeing none, we'll move forward to committee reports. Um, Kate Coleman with Catalog. Good morning, everybody. Uh, before I jump into a few things that I just wanted to mention, I'd like for Liz to talk about how successful the regional trainings have been so far this year. I thought you were going to talk more. Okay. <laughs> so. Hello, everyone. I have seen you all at Cedar County on March 15th, and Scenic Regional March training and uh, Regional Trains have been going fantastic. Um, if you have not registered and you plan to attend, please go to OU and register for the event. But we have had great participation from, you know, member libraries, incoming libraries, and I'd like to think we had some fun. So join us. Join us um, for regional trainings. Coming up, the next one is April 19th, and a week from today in Poplar Bluff. Um, also, throughout our little cataloging community, I have heard nothing but good things about our new certification that is through Odoo. Um, if you were an OG and took the original certification, um, this is much more streamlined, and Liz has done a terrific job. Um, two things that I wanted to mention, if you did not know, Liz uh, made a 100 page plus crib sheet document um, and catalogers, we love a good crib sheet. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's essentially a cheat sheet is, and it's just example after example of mint mark records for each scenario of material that you could potentially be cataloging. So um, it, there is, it's, it's smart cataloging to look at crib sheets and, you know, let those inform you and help you on um, how to correctly catalog. So um, they're, they're a great benefit to all of us. And just one more thing I wanted to mention that we talked about in our last meeting. Um, this is not a widespread issue, but I did want to mention that as you're all aware, we use monograph parts in Missouri Evergreen. Um, if you have a set that you have uh, named, if you have a part on it that is complete set, if you have lost part of that complete set, it is no longer a complete set. So even if you are still searching it as complete set, if you're missing disc three, you can no longer say that it's the complete set on your holdings. You need to individualize those discs that you do have or need, and serve them separately because obviously you are you do not actually have the complete set. Anybody have any questions about cataloging? If you do, Liz will answer them. Good <laughs> <laughs> um, question. Um, your crib sheets, mm -hmm. where do they reside? Are they on the website? Okay, so currently they are uh, in Odoo in the course documents. They are also in the drop down under documents. And once I put the last call out for the meeting on Monday, if anybody has any they'd like me to add, they will go onto the regular website. But I just added Tony boxes. So that was Great, thank you. Okay, if we have no more questions for cataloging, we will move on to circulation with Rhonda Buffy. Okay, good morning. I want to pick up right where um, Kate left off. If you receive an item that does, that is supposed to be a complete set, and it's missing a set, 
send it back to the home library. Um, you're going to need to place a fold for your patron on a different item. Um, it's going to take, you know, catalogers, we need to give them time to get everything corrected. So if it happens, just send it back, place another fold. Um, the Missouri Evergreen Consortium circulation policy requires all of its members to attend at least four circulation committee meetings per year. And so I want to remind you, if you cannot make the date or the time, it is possible to view that recording on our YouTube channel. And it's also possible to view the minute um, in, on the website. You just go into uh, member resources and under circulation training materials. So um, we have kind of been tracking to see where we are on how we're doing on attendance. Um, and so what I'd like to do is if you are one of those libraries that you cannot make it on that fourth Tuesday at 11 o'clock and you have been diligently going in or even if you've just gone in some and viewed those videos or read those minutes, would you please email me as the chairman? Um, my email is posted um, on the website, so feel free to just send me that. Um, and going forward, if you would continue to do that. So we are going to, the circulation committee is going to give you a reasonable amount of time for us to get kind of caught up on who has been doing that and we just didn't know it. Um, after that, um, we will start contacting you and kind of trying to talk through how can we get this happening? Especially the larger, the more libraries that come in, um, things change and we need to stay up to date on what is happening so that the whole consortium is working as well as possible. So that would be a change. Just feel free to email me. I'll get you up to date in my little uh, graph of who's been there when and we'll go on from there. Um, recently, there's been some report, there's been reports that as you're running reports, they're bogged down and it's taking much longer to um, get those reports than what we would hope they would take. So upon investigation, we found out that um, Equinox can run two reports concurrently. And so Steve, I think, has been working with them or, or talking to them oh. at least to see how, what we could do to improve that. Um, there, there is another issue and it involves one library. So I, I'm not gonna embarrass the one library and I'm not gonna call out and say, everybody stop doing this when I know it's just one library that's doing it. So I just found out about this week. I'm going, I need to follow up with that library. And what it is, is they're doing something that's inadvertently yeah. grabbing all the system resources when they don't, when they could do it a different way. Sure. And so, so I will talk to that library before I go on vacation and hopefully that will help. So just to let you know, there is, we are working on it with the hope that it will improve. Also there, and I, I don't know if this is even possible, a thought that we could perhaps get information from Equinox, what are the most high volume times that reports are being run so that if it's not an essential thing that you need right now, you could potentially schedule it at a time that's not going to be as busy. We all know the beginning of the month, some of those kinds of things, but are there high volume times that we could avoid that would make it better? So we're going to be talking to Equinox about that. I'm not sure if we can get that information or not, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and then, <laughs> One other thing, um, if you are a library that group patrons in patron groups, um, Equinox has added the functionality that we can now view all the expiration dates for people in a group at one time. And so to do that, you just use that column picker out to the right side and the column that you need to add is called privilege expiration date. You enable that, save it, and then you would be able to see all of the expiration dates for everybody in that group. 
Um, our next meeting will be Tuesday, April 22nd. And so hopefully I'll see you there. Uh, forward any kind of things, you know, problems or issues, feel free to forward them to me. Okay. Any questions for Rhonda? Okay, if not, thank you for that report and we'll move, move forward. Next on the agenda is reports with Tony Miller. I did not see Tony on the Zoom though. I, I don't either, Ron. I, I don't think that he's uh, with us today, but he gave a really nice report yesterday on the on report basics. So, okay. The reports committee still does meet. Um, we're kind of talking about what frequency they need to have their meetings. Um, but Tony would love some company on that committee. So if you have a person from your library who's really good at reports, who has that um, technical knowledge to think like the computer, sit, you know, send him Tony's way. He could, could use some company on the committee. And so now we will move forward to the onboarding committee report with Leanne Santi. Hello, everyone. I uh, really don't have a lot to really add. I know uh, Steve went over the upcoming migrations. So that was pretty much covered there. And I do want to thank uh, Mary Kay Amrich for working with the presentation during this. Since unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, attend, I had other conflicts. So um, I'm excited to kind of hear some feedback on that presentation and how that went. And if Mary's on here, I don't know if she wants to kind of speak to that or if there were any other questions. The name change. Um, we have proposed name change for the onboarding committee. Leanne, the, if you remember, the committee's talked about this moving to the name Consortium Assistance Network to continue to provide onboarding services and educational services for newly onboarded staff at existing Missouri. So that would be the CAN committee. The CAN, the CAN. Yep. And there is no CAN't. There is no CAN't in the CAN committee. Yep, we all can. Yeah, I think this is a great uh, move as far as the direction and the intent of the committee. And hopefully this will kind of provide some needed assistance to, um, you know, what we're doing here with the consortium. Yeah, I, and I think that it's a great name. I don't know who came up with it, but it really um, it really does say a lot about what the committee is doing now. And I like the fact that the networking, that is what we all do is network and we're all here for each other. So I do like that name. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, we have Jane with Mala with us. Hello, I thanks for letting me come yesterday and talk way over my time and not even finish. So I'm gonna keep it really short today. Um, surveys will probably go out before we meet again in June. So just a reminder, those are required as a grant participant with the State Library. So. We're gonna do them a little earlier, probably. I'm hoping to get them out in May and give you just a month to do it. I think I think there's only 10 questions. At the most, there's 12 questions. There We try every year to streamline it. It's very, very similar year to year, but we try to condense to get, you know, use your time wisely. Um, I talked about annual agreements yesterday. So those all went out. We've already gotten quite a few back for, like on the first day or two. So that's great. Some invoices went out last week, mostly the ones um, that are just one or two day or she's on vacation this week. And so the rest will go out next week. Reminder, the annual agreements are due in June, but if you owe us um, for extra days, that's not due till August. So even we, we just send them early because so many of ours are just uh, of our 128 most of them are just state-funded um, 
though grant funded. So that's easy to get them out and done with. Um, I think that's it. Basically, I talked a lot yesterday. So if anyone has any question, um, let me know. Anybody who we suggested uh, had volume that needed increase, I sent those emails with amounts back in March. So everybody else, it should be just our standard, you know, increase with Henry's increase, et cetera. So um, any, any questions for me, let me know. I appreciated coming yesterday. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry that I missed it yesterday. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the whole whole <laughs> meeting yesterday, but um, I, like I told them earlier, I'd rather it had been there than sitting in a hospital waiting room on the floor for 11 hours. So. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that, Ron. Um, there are no further questions for Jane. Y'all didn't exhaust her yesterday. <laughs> we they were, were great. <laughs> I have a <laughs> question, Ron. Okay. Um, Jane, I know that uh, Adair is coming online uh, for uh, the uh, courier stuff as well as just Evergreen in general. Yes. We're like 30 minutes away from them. Like I drive there every week. So <laughs> I just want I just want to know that I'm still supposed to send it through the courier, right? <laughs> you are. Yes. Don't, okay. you, you don't as easy to, as it is. <laughs> exactly. You don't need to drive every week. And we did talk yesterday, it came up of people were concerned of how we kind of monitored um, uh, oncoming evergreen libraries. And so we keep a very close eye. So to make sure they have the right amount of days and we build in some um, extra, like at, when we do the grant, we know that there'll be four or five libraries coming on. So there's some extra funding in there if they have to go up one, you know, into a two day a week or three day a week. And that's all through the state library. But know that we do that. And Janet and I and Robin keep a very close eye on those statistics because they go, here you are, and then you're there. So, and then sometimes you're there. And so we do keep an eye on that and are in contact with those directors. So, but yeah, you can stop the drive every day. Well, you can still go, but. <laughs> Any further questions for Jay? All righty. Let's move forward to uh, Missouri State Library. I know that Janet is there in person. Is that correct still? Uh, a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, to follow up on Jane's presentation yesterday and just what she mentioned uh, this morning, I do want to reiterate that if you have a missed stop that you put a report in, even if you are going to have another stop later that week, like if you have five days, they miss a stop. Well, they're going to be here tomorrow. I'm, I'm not going to make a report. Please make a report is ultimately, if you don't, you're paying for a service that was not provided. And I know there's a long way from how the funds really get from <laughs> the grant to the driver. But ultimately, as it makes its way through, paying for a service that's not provided if you do not report the missed stop. We do uh, give credits for missed stops, and we just kind of really started um, tracking those this year. And what we have come up to is a formula because it's hard to determine if that stop and really track if that stop was on a LSTA funded day or a library funded day, we just use a formula of I think a stop cost is twenty six dollars and seventy eight cents. So, so whatever that cost per day is, divided by however many like four fifths or three two fifths, whatever whatever the, your stops are, plus funded by state versus library, and then we divvy that up. So um, for credits for the library, I talked to Jane yesterday and you probably will be do, getting a check and it'll be yearly. And it's not going to be a whole lot, but it does. We, we wanted to 
get that money back to the libraries as possible. Because in the previously, all the credit went to the grant, even if it was for a library funded stock. And now we're like, no, libraries need to get that credit also. That's the way we. It seemed to be the easiest way to determine how much goes to state library and the library for the credit. Um, and also for uh, Jane for building in, uh, as Jane mentioned, we do build in stocks for new libraries that join the consortium. Usually it's we uh, have like one additional stock per library. So if you're a one library, one stock library already and you join, we'll um, just build into the grant for another stock. So if you have five libraries joining, we'll build in five additional stocks. So that's taken care of. And then one thing I've started this year and with Adair is I actually gave Dana information of like your current volume with Mala is this amount. And looking at the volume for other libraries that were around that, that then joined Evergreen. So you can kind of see, okay, what kind of jump in volume you might anticipate. So I know Dana is appreciative of that. It's not going to be apples to oranges, you know, but it's something to see. It's like, oh, I'm going to, I was at 200. I may go up to 1,200 items a year. And it's like, you know, and your mentor libraries talk to you, go like, expect this, get more bags. But sometimes even that little bit number is like, oh, that much. <laughs> really cool. Um, and then the last thing I have is about our tech ladder grants. The applications were due April 1st. So Terry and Robin and I have reviewed all those. Um, we'll continue boot process. As if for those who attended the monthly public library director forum, you heard that we had more requests. Then we have funds for tech ladder grants. So most of those we're going to have some um, not outright denials, but it's like, okay, you're going to have to pay for some of these things from local funds. So we try not to do just outright denials unless we, you know, unless there's really good reason. Um, so instead, what we try to do to come under that budget is to uh, have the libraries pick up more of the tasks of this week. That's all I have. Um, I don't know if Robin's here. Um, I don't want to add. She hasn't been attending lately. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's not logged on. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. One thing, one thing I would like to say, and I understand this is old news from yesterday about the addition of the discovery layer. Um, I'd really like to thank Janet and the whole staff at Missouri State Library that worked to modify our grant so that we can make this happen. Um, huge leap forward for us. Um, and the State Library has been on board with us and really trying to help us get where we need to be. So. I just want to express my appreciation to them publicly for that support. So next item on the agenda is other matters. I know one of our big other matters we need to recognize, even though she's not here, is um, Diane Disbro has been such an integral part of the consortium for so long, and she is retiring in a matter of days. Um, it, it is going to be really weird to not see her on my emails on a daily basis, um, raising questions and just the institutional knowledge we are losing with her retiring. Um, so I do want to you know, publicly thank her for her service and 
you know, acknowledge how much she will be missed. And with Diane's retirement, we do have a vacancy on the board. Um, so I would call on Sue with the nominating committee to discuss how we're going to fill that. Okay. So, yes, um, the nominating committee of myself, Carrie, uh, Klein, and Karen, um, we met, we talked about the vacated seat of Diane's this Rose retirement that's effective next Wednesday. We had heard from Steve Campbell about his desire to have one of the scenic regional staff uh, fill the vacated seat. However, Steve didn't name a, a name of a particular individual, um, but please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, so we were looking at some viable candidates who had already expressed some interest um, in serving on the Missouri Evering Board. Um, I did reach out to Mary Beth Rebels. Um, she did confirm that she would be willing to serve. Mary Beth has met the non-outlined, I'm going to say those words, non-outlined criteria of being involved with the MEC board, uh, executive board, um, as she's been a part of um, MEC for almost a year, very, very close to, to being here. She's also part of a bigger library system with branches and populations. Um, her years of service in various boards with uh, MPLD, MALA, Grand River Library Consortium and local and regional boards also speaks well to her um, her, des her desire and passion for public libraries. Therefore, the recommendation of the nominated committee is Mary Beth Rebels to serve in the vacated seat um, until 2025. And of course, we will take some nominations from the board. Okay, we have heard from the nominating committee are there nominations from the floor for the soon to be vacated position on the executive board? I'll give people time to unmute or type in the chat. Are there any more nominations from the floor? Okay, so we have a nomination from the nominating committee to um, appoint Mary Beth Revels to the unexpired term um, vacancy created by Diane Disbrow's retirement. Do I have a motion to accept their recommendation? So moved. <laughs> Do I have a second on the motion? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. You weren't supposed to. No, it was not. <laughs> Just side it, conversation. It, it, it's all good. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? Okay, if not, the chair calls for a vote. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. We all said aye over here. <laughs> it, there, this lag is just getting to me. Any opposed? All righty. So Mary Beth will start, move on to the executive board committee upon the retirement of Diane Disbro. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you. We'll be added to the listservs for the executive board. Or anything else to be brought up under other matters? And Mary Beth says thank you. She is happy to serve. Anything else under other matters? Okay, our next general membership meeting will be Wednesday, June 5th at 8 a.m. via Zoom and in person at the NPLD meeting. So until then, I would call for a motion to adjourn. Oh, I make that motion. <laughs> okay. And a second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. We, we stand adjourned.
thank you for attending everybody and safe travels to those of you in Colombia. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all. Okay, I need to make I'm sorry. Thank you.